Welcome to Mission Online. Happy New Year. I'm Pastor Richard, and I wanna welcome you to a new year of worship and time in God's Word through Mission Church. And I'm excited. We're starting a new series today with Pastor Kyle, and I know it'll be a rich blessing to you. Again, thanks for joining us. excited to start a brand new series called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I don't know about you, but the week between Christmas and New Year's is one of my favorite weeks of the year. It's like that one time of year when you actually forget what day of the week it is. And I keep having to look at my phone and try to remember like, is it Wednesday? Is it Friday? I have no idea. You just kind of go into this gray space, right? The holidays are over. You're all, all the busyness of Christmas is behind you and yet you don't have any responsibilities. And so you just get to hang out and and hopefully you had some time with family. We flew down to Texas to be able to spend some time with our family. And we had some great rest and some great time away. And it was, it was nice to be able to have that break. And I, I, I think coming back from that trip, we, we flew back in on, on the first day of the year. And we're flying in late at night. And we get home and we're all tired and worn out. And of course, the next day is Sunday. And so we're preparing for a busy week, right? The kids have to go back to school on Monday morning. The work has to happen Monday morning. Like all of the adulting things need to happen and take off. And so I remember that, that Sunday, we all slept in. We're all tired from our trip and, and from the, the busyness of travel and everything else. But, but we had so much to do. We had laundry and we had dishes and, and there was no food in the pantry or the refrigerator and we had all these things that needed to be done to be able to get ready for this new week to start and, and we're just sort of coming out of the fog of vacation and then Monday morning rolls around, alarms are going off, kids oversleep their alarms, everybody's stressed out and hurried and in this mad scramble to get back into the routine and the rhythm of life. 
I don't know if you feel that way sometimes, but a lot of times I just feel hurried and rushed and busy everywhere that I go. And, and as nice as it is to have a break during the holidays, when you get back into the, the swing of things, it's stressful and, and there's so much going on and, and you just feel busy, you feel tired, you feel overwhelmed and stressed out. I don't know if you can relate to that, but I feel that. I feel this all the time, this that feeling, that horrible feeling when you wake up and you've overslept your alarm and now you're in a rush and you've got to fly around all day to get everything done that you need to do. I mean, it, it just makes your whole day feel off kilter, like everything is, is behind and, and you're driving in a hurry and you're rushing from one thing to the next and, and you feel perpetually behind. You feel rushed, you feel hurried all the time. In this series, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the strain, the anxiety that that causes in our lives, the stress that's caused by the busy, hurried pace that we live. It's really becoming just a problem. In fact, I want you to know as we kick off this series that as I'm teaching this, I'm preaching to myself as much as anyone else because I'm guilty of the same thing. I have this busyness. I don't know about you, but I thought about this sometimes when I'm driving, do you ever drive through one of those areas and they have the little sign as you drive by that shows your speed limit compared to that actual speed limit? It shows how fast you're driving. And, and you know, when you're driving, it's, it's trying to get you to slow down because it's trying to get you to see that you're exceeding the speed limit. And I don't know about you, but I always have this inner temptation to try to drive as fast as I can to get that number as high as I can when I'm driving past it, right? Because we're always in a hurry. We're always in a hurry. Maybe, maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you feel busy. Maybe you feel going into this new year a little bit overwhelmed. Maybe you feel tired. Not just tired like I need a nap, but tired like my soul in the inside. Something is tired and exhausted and I can't fix it by just taking a nap or a vacation. I, I mean, maybe you just feel overwhelmed. See, the problem is we're busy. We're not just busy, but we're too busy. All of us, we have so many things going on and, and sometimes being busy is, is not working for us, right? I mean, maybe you coming into a new year set some resolutions and you decided, well, I wanna lose weight or I wanna get my finances in line or I wanna be more disciplined or I wanna get up earlier or I wanna read more books or whatever. I mean, those goals are great, but a lot of times it's just adding more things to a busy schedule. And then we wonder why people's New Year's resolutions fall flat or their goals don't pan out. I mean, so often we have these different things at play and all we're doing is adding more stuff to our plate. It's like that old circus act when you would go to the circus as a kid and, and there was the performer who was spinning the plates on the poles and they would start with one plate and they would spin it and it was easy for them to do. They could keep the one plate spinning and then they would add a second and a third and they would have to come back to this one and spin it and then go to the next one and spin it. And by the time they got to the third, they're running back to the first one to spin it. And after a while, they have multiple sticks with multiple plates all spinning at the same time. And they're frantically running back and forth to each one to keep spinning it, to keep making life happen. And sometimes that's how we feel, isn't it? Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you can relate. In fact, psychologists and uh, health professionals have identified an actual sickness. They've, they've coined it as a real disease and it's called hurry sickness. It's defined like this, a behavioral pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. I mean, this is like a real diagnosable disease that, that health and mental wellness professionals have said, we have a problem. We've got this hurry sickness and it's pervading our culture. Well, how do you know if you have it? Well, there's actually quizzes you can take. There's tests that they came up with to determine, do you have this hurry sickness? And they ask you questions like this. Do you treat everything as a race? I, I mean, think about it. I'm guilty of this. Uh, when I'm driving on the I-10, I'm like, that car's not going to beat me on the exit ramp. You know, I'm going to beat them. And, and when I come up to a, a stop sign, I'm jockeying to get into the lane with the fewest cars. Oh, that lane only has two. This one has three. And I'm trying to change lanes. 
We treat everything like it's a race. Sometimes we go to the grocery store and we're angling to get into the shortest line. Sometimes we go to places like Disney and, and, and we're trying to beat the system and beat the lines and use the fast pass and rush over to this ride before anyone else can get there. And, and we're always playing this game, right? You treat everything as a race. Or maybe it's this, maybe it's like you find it impossible to just do one thing at a time. Your whole life is one big multitasking mess, right? You're constantly bouncing from one project to the next, getting interrupted constantly. Oh, now there's a text to respond to. Oh, now an email just popped up. Oh, I'm back to my original. And we're just flighty and flustered, jumping from one thing to the next. Do you ever experience irritability and frustration when you get delayed going somewhere or doing something? Of course, like all of these things are symptoms of this hurry sickness and we all have it. We all wrestle with this. I know I'm guilty as charged. When I did this little quiz, there were six of the questions and I, I went through honestly evaluating myself and I said, I think I'm guilty of all six of these things. I think I'm sick with this hurry sickness. What's more is we have this problem in our culture where busyness has become a badge of honor, right? It's like this, this thing that we want to project to other people. I mean, when we run into people in the supermarket or on the street, what do we say? Hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm good. I'm busy. Just busy, right? We're always busy. And it's kind of like this badge of honor, right? No one wants to pretend like they have nothing going on. No one wants to be like, oh, I've got everything in my life under control. No, no one wants to feel like they're not being productive. In fact, we've equated busyness with significance. We've equated busyness with success, with productivity, with accomplishment. We, we've equated busyness with, with lives that matter or are significant somehow. And, and so if we're not busy, it's a problem. I mean, think about it. What is the opposite of busy. What is the opposite of hurry? The opposite is slow, right? Slow is the opposite. And in our culture, slow is a bad word. Slow is not something that we want to be. I mean, think about it. When you go to a restaurant and the service is really terrible, what do you say? Oh, well, it was slow, right? When you go to a bad movie, what do you say? Well, it was really slow movie. It wasn't good, right? When, when you talk about someone who just doesn't have it all together, who isn't really all there, you say, well, he's just a little slow, right? I mean, slow is a negative term. None of us want to feel like we're slow. And, and so busy is not just a problem because we're overwhelmed and anxious and tired and, and sick with hurry, but hurry is a problem because We've embraced this as this badge of honor in our culture that we have to be busy if we're significant, if we're important, that it's somehow a measure of our importance, the busyness, the busyness in our lives. Well, as we jump into this series, it's kind of based on a book. It's a, it's a book that's by a guy named John Mark Comer, and I would encourage you to read the book and get a copy of it and, and dig in. And I want to say right up front that some of the themes we're talking about come out of that book. And I want to give credit here where credit's due. And in the book, there's actually a fascinating story about a pastor named John Ortberg, highly successful pastor and author, written many books on the bestsellers list, all these things. And John Ortberg had a mentor by the name of Dallas Willard. And Dallas Willard, if you're not familiar with him, great philosopher, teacher, uh, professor, uh, theologian. You need to read his books. You need, to, you need to experience him. Amazing guy. So anyways, at one point, John Ortberg, the last person you would think who needs any advice or any counsel on how to do life, right? He's working at a mega church, one of the most influential churches in the world. He's on the top bestsellers list with his books. He's got all these speaking engagements you would think that he's got life by the tail. And yet he calls Dallas Willard, his mentor. He says, I'm, I'm just feeling the emptiness. I, I'm feeling the struggle. I'm, I'm feeling like all of life is frantic. And what do I need to do, Dallas, in order to be the best version of myself? What do I need to do? And there was a long silent pause on the other end of the phone. And Dallas Willard, after a long pause, said these words. John, you need to ruthlessly eliminate 
hurry from your life. And so John takes a notepad and he writes this down, ruthless, ruthlessly eliminate hurry. And then he, he turns back to Dallas on the phone call and he says, okay, I got that one down. Now what next? What else do I need to do in order to be the best version of myself? And, and another pause. And Willard comes back and says, that's it. That's it. He says, Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And that was it. That was the, that was the gold nugget, right? And, and, and I've thought about this. I, I've thought about that quote from Dallas Willard that hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. And, and, and that's been something that I've chewed on and wrestled on as I've read this book many times over the past couple of years. And, and I thought about this. I thought, what about enemies like evil? What about enemies like COVID? What about enemies like war and violence, racism? What about enemies like Satan himself? I mean, we could think of all these enemies and you're saying, Dallas Willard, that the number one enemy of the spiritual life is hurry, is busyness, is, is, is this frantic pace of life that we have. And the more I've thought about it and the more I've wrestled with it, you know what? I think he's right because I think hurry destroys our relationship with God. It destroys our relationship with others. In fact, think about this. When you look at the life of Jesus, if you read through the gospels in scripture and, and you just study the life of Jesus, you'll never see Jesus in a hurry. I mean, this is God in the flesh and, and, and Jesus is traveling and speaking and doing miracles and working with the multitudes and discipling his, his followers. Jesus is doing all these things. It's not that he didn't have anything important to do. It's not that he wasn't significant. I mean, Jesus actually accomplished more in three years than you and I will ever accomplish in a lifetime. And yet Jesus was never hurried. In fact, one of the stories I love about Jesus is the story, he, he runs into this guy named Jairus. And Jairus comes to him and says, Jesus, you've got to come to my house, right? This is in Luke 8 or, or Mark chapter 8 in the Bible. And, and Jairus is, is coming to him and saying, my daughter is sick. You've got to come and, and heal her. You've, you've got to come and minister to her because she's going to die. And, and so Jesus is on his way. And you can just imagine the urgency that Jairus would have had. I mean, Jesus, you've got to get there. My daughter is so sick. She may not make it. You've got to get there in time. And, and you can imagine that he is rushing Jesus and they go through this busy marketplace. And Jesus suddenly stops in the middle of the marketplace, people all around. And Jesus says, wait a minute, someone just touched the hem of my garment. And, and it was the woman who had the issue of blood. And, and Jesus turns and he has this whole interaction with this woman who had been bleeding and who had had this problem and Jesus heals her there in the marketplace. And you can just imagine what Jairus is thinking in that moment. I mean, he's got to be thinking, Jesus, wait. I, I mean, I'm sure that lady's important too, but my daughter, like, let's go. Like, I'm in a hurry. Come on, can't we get home? And in the midst of that conversation, someone comes up to Jairus and says, Jairus, I've got bad news. Your daughter just passed away. You got to imagine what he's thinking. Jesus, if you hadn't stopped here in the marketplace to, to talk to this other woman, we could have gotten home in time. And, and yet Jesus says to Jairus, just have faith and believe and your daughter will be well. Right? And, and I love that story because it, it reminds me that though Jesus was busy and though he was rushing, you know, from, from so many different pulls on his time and his schedule and so many things that people wanted from him, Jesus was never in a hurry. You never see Jesus snapping at his disciples like I probably do with my kids. Come on, hurry up. Let's go. Get out of the shower. Get in bed. Get, get out of the car. Let's go into the store. We need to shop for things, whatever. I mean, Jesus wasn't saying that to Peter, James, and John. Jesus wasn't rushing them. Jesus wasn't pushing them. He was never in a hurry. He was always at a pace that was sustainable. And I, I want you to think about this. When we talk about Jesus. What did Jesus say, <coughs> pardon me, was the greatest commandment? I mean, people came to him and said, Jesus, 
There's so many commands in the Old Testament. How do we boil it all down? How do we live for God? What is the expectation? And, and Jesus said, the greatest command is what? You know this. The greatest commandment is love. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus boiled the whole law and all the commandments down to these two things, love God and love others. Now here's the problem. I want you to think about this. this I think this is so profound, right? Love is incompatible with hurry. I mean, think about it. When you're hurried and rushed, you don't have time to be loving. You don't have time to show kindness to a stranger. You don't have time to be gentle. When you're rushed in and hurried, I mean, if I think about it and I'm honest with myself, many of my worst moments, many of my times when I've lost my temper with my kids or become impatient with my wife or said things that have hurt other people have been when I was rushed and impatient and in a hurry. I mean, the Apostle Paul gets ready to write that famous chapter, right? The chapter about love, 1 Corinthians 13. What does Paul say? He starts out this description, this beautiful description about love. And he says, love is what? Love is patient. Love is patient. Why did he have to say that, right? I mean, love is patient, love is kind, love is gentle. Like he goes into all of these things about love, but, but the first one on the list is love is patient. I, I mean, you can't do love and hurry at the same time. These two things are incompatible. So what's the solution? We have this problem, we're too busy, and hurry is not just exhausting us and making us tired and weary and worn out and impatient with others, but it's killing us from the inside out. It's killing our soul. And how do we come to a solution? How, how do we find a place where, where we can move forward? I, I mean, some of us think the answer is more time, right? If I just had more time, have you ever said that to yourself? Like, I just need more hours in the day. If I just had three more hours, instead of 24, I had 27, 28 hours. Just think of all the things that I could get done. Some of us, I, I've said this before too. I've said, if I could just clone myself, right? And then I could have two of me to get everything done, then life would be so much better because I could accomplish everything that needs to be accomplished. Some of us think, well, I just need better time management or I need better goals or, or structures to help me. And those, those things can be very helpful, but I wanna challenge us. I've, I've taken a lot of time to, to kind of set up the problem. But in the rest of this series, we're gonna be talking about the answer to the problem. And the answer is not better time management or more time. The answer is a new way of life, a new way of life. I want to share with you an invitation from Jesus. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, when we hear those Phrases, it seems a little foreign to us because we don't all know what a yoke is. But, but a yoke was actually a farming instrument. I, I mean, it was kind of a, a figure eight shaped instrument that would go over the neck of two oxen as they were plowing in a field. It would keep them in sync and it would allow them to work together and share the burden of plowing together as they, as they worked in tandem. And, and so Jesus, Jesus is saying, I want you to embrace my yoke. Now, as a, as a teacher, as a rabbi, Jesus was, was like a lot of other rabbis. And rabbis had what was known in their culture as a, a yoke. This, this was like an expectation or a set of teachings, the way they taught the Torah or the teachings of Scripture. It was their, their teachings on how to live a, a better life, how to be a human being under God, how to follow God, and how to live for God. And so what was unique about Jesus was not that he had a yoke, but that his yoke was light, that his yoke was easy. And Jesus is inviting us into his yoke. Jesus is inviting us to be his followers, his apprentices, right? And, and, and a follower of Jesus or an apprentice, their whole goal is to model their entire life after their rabbi, after their teacher. And Jesus is inviting us and saying, I want you to model your whole life, the whole way that you do everything 
after me. I, I want you to watch me and, and learn from me. And when we talk about this, we talk about three things. We talk about being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. And, and here's the truth that I want you to catch is that if we want to experience the life of Jesus, we have to embrace the lifestyle of Jesus, right? I mean, in, in our Western culture, we've kind of lost sight of the fact that Jesus is calling us to a way of life. Sometimes we think that Christianity is, is Jesus calling us to a theology, to a set of beliefs, to a, a list of things that we need to know and believe. Or, or sometimes we think it's, it's a list of rules of things we're supposed to do and not to do, uh, an, an ethics course that we need to follow on how to live our lives. But that's not it at all. It's, it's a lifestyle. You see, a yoke that Jesus is calling to, it was it was a work instrument. It was, was used for plowing a field. So Jesus is not calling us to lazy boy Christianity, right? Come and sit on the couch and enjoy. And, and in some ways, that seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? I mean, when Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and, and tired and heavy laden, what, wouldn't you think what they really need is, is a nap? Wouldn't you think what they really need is a comfortable bed and, and a vacation? I, I mean, that's what you would think they need, not a, a work instrument. But but here's the thing, all of those things are great. Vacations are great and breaks are great and naps are great and all that stuff, but those are all temporary solutions. And what Jesus is offering is a permanent solution. Jesus is saying, I, I'm not just giving you a temporary escape from the challenges of life. I'm offering you a new way to live your life, a way that's healthy, a way that's good, a way that when you do life my way, you can experience the kind of life that I offer. See, none of us can escape the burdens of life. We all have work. We all have school. We all have the, the busyness and the pressures of life, bills to pay, relationships to build and maintain, like homes that need to be cleaned, laundry that needs to be washed. I mean, these are all things that all of us have to do, and it's just part of life, right? Life is stressful and challenging. That's not the problem. The problem is when we try to do life without doing it God's way. Jesus is inviting us to come and find rest in him. Jesus is inviting us to a better way of life, a way of life that brings hope and peace and joy and, and a way of life that feeds and, and gives life to our souls. And so in this series, we're gonna be talking about how can we as a, as a church, how can we as a people slow down and hit the pause button I mean, if we're going to be people of God, if we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to be with Jesus and become like Jesus and do what Jesus did, how do we do that? We're talking this year as a church about being grounded in the word of God, about being centered, about all of our life focused on him. And the reality is some of us are so busy, so overwhelmed and so tired, we don't have the margin to do that. We've got to get to a healthy place where, where we're saying, Jesus, we want to embrace your lifestyle. We want you to lead us. I, I want to close by reading these verses for you in the message translation because they're so beautifully put, and I hope that it ministers to you. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, Jesus says. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. That's the discipleship part of it, right? Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love that phrase, unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Jesus invites us into an easy yoke into a light burden. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. Let's start today. Let's make a commitment. I'm not gonna just make New Year's resolutions, set goals, add more things to my plate, try harder to do more. No, I'm gonna yoke myself to Jesus. I'm gonna let him do the heavy lifting. I'm gonna embrace his way of life and I'm gonna let him take me into a place of true rest. Let's pray. God, thank you that you offer to bring us into true rest in relationship with you. 
And Lord Jesus, we pray that in this series, you would teach us and you would shape us and challenge us so that we can become more like you, so that we can know you in a deeper way and walk with you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us because we need to ruthlessly eliminate the hurry that is in our lives. And I pray that you would give us the wisdom and the grace to embrace and follow the way of Jesus. Lord, I pray for those that might be watching that have never trusted in Jesus as Savior, because that's really the first step to walking with you and growing and becoming like Jesus. And so I pray, Lord, that, that they would hear the invitation of Jesus, come to me if you're weary and burdened and heavy laden. And God, we just praise you uh, for what you're doing and how you're working in our lives. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough and then you came along and put me back together
Well, that was a great start to our series. I'm ex personally excited about uh, the weeks ahead of us and what we're going to learn about just sort of slowing down and being still and recognizing our God. Well, we've got some exciting things going on at Mission Church as we begin this new year. I want to encourage you to get on our website or go to our church app and you'll find there some information. Uh, if you'll click there, even on the link on your platform, you can find out about the next steps. We, we always encourage folks at Mission to take the next step with the Lord and with our church. And we are offering right now, this Sunday, the 9th of January, and next Sunday, the 16th, during our second service at 11 o'clock in our conference room in the lobby, our growth track class. And this is an opportunity for you to know more about Mission Church, where we've come from, where we're going by God's grace, and opportunities for you to serve and get involved in Mission Church. We'd love for you to sign up for that class and be a part of it. Also, we're excited about an important next step. Perhaps you've trusted Christ as your Savior, but you've not yet obeyed Him in believer's baptism. And we're going to give you that opportunity on the 30th of this month, Sunday the 30th, and we're going to have two classes on that as well. There's information on our website about that, and we'd love for you to be a part of that as well. Again, thank you for joining us today, and I hope you'll join us again uh, next week on Mission Church Online. God bless you.